So we're going to talk about moments about the mean, also known as central moments, just two different names for the same exact thing. So this is a useful concept because it connects together a lot of different ideas in statistics and how we measure data and summarize it. And it's going to sort of lead the way to connect from what we've already learned about finding a mean, finding variance, and finding standard deviation. It's going to connect to those things. It's also going to connect to a couple new ideas that are really useful. Skewness, which is basically how much a uh, distribution of data sort of skews to the left. You can see here there's more of a tail of data to the left and a short tail of data to the right. Or it could be sort of the opposite and have a longer tail to the right than to the left. So that kind of difference is measured by skewness. <laughs> Need two S's. And it also connects to kurtosis. And kurtosis is a little bit harder to explain intuitively than skewness, but it basically tells us the difference between distributions of data that are very tight in the middle and spread out for a long time versus distributions of data that are all sort of pecked into the same area with really no tail to either side. Now when you look at words like kurtosis and skewness and you have to learn them, it's easy to sort of imagine that somebody just thought these up and thought the math up all at one time and, and sort of said, we should have something called kurtosis and it should have a lot of complicated math. I always find it really useful in learning statistics to remember that all of statistics has just come from things people have found useful. People were sort of looking for simple mathematical ways to measure aspects of data because they had so much data and when they graph it out and they graph out some other data and compare it, they, they need sort of simple ways to compare them to each other. And people have just found these different ways that they can have relatively simple, repeatable math that you can apply to kind of any data that can give you these, these estimates. And that's all that mean and average are. You know, for example, it'll just say, you know, okay, well, one thing we can, we can tell about the height of every person in the country, say, or about the, you know, a, amount of some chemical present in some food. Um, it, the first sort of important thing is what's the average amount? But the average amount only tells us a tiny bit about the whole thing. So there's all these different ways that we can describe an aspect of a whole bunch of data in one sort of simple way. And, and that's where so much of statistics comes from. So a lot of it is just people have discovered kurtosis as one sort of relatively simple way that you can do math and summarize an aspect of a data distribution. People have just sort of discovered the... the concept of skewness. And, you know, they could have named these things other things. These are just words that people gave to sort of remember what, what a certain kind of math uh, operation tells them about data. So the first thing that's confusing about the moment about the mean, also known as the central moment, is this word moment. Because we're used to thinking of a moment like an instant in time. And this is not that kind of moment. This is related more to words that we know like momentum and momentous. So if you think of a momentous occasion, it's an occasion that's full of meaning. It's not uh, an occasion that happens in one moment, one instant. It's an occasion that may take a, a while and the whole thing has meaning throughout. Same thing with momentum. If you think about, say, a spinning wheel, um, and we're going to say the wheel is spinning in this direction up here and maybe closer to the center it's spinning, but it's spinning sort of at a slower speed and down here it's spinning at a slower speed and this outside part is spinning at a faster speed. 
we could measure the speed in every single part of that wheel and describe it using a ton of data. But a really simple way to simplify it so that we get the whole thing kind of in one go is to just say, well, it has this kind of circular angular momentum. And that summary tells us a lot of information in just kind of one number and one concept. And that's basically how we're going to use moment in statistics. We're going to say, all right, given some tons of data, maybe we have a thousand data points or, or ten or a million, um, well, what are some ways that we can describe the data that sort of summarize the whole thing and tell us about every little bit of data altogether in one kind of sense? And just as in this spinning wheel, we really care about the momentum sort of relative to the center. Like maybe this wheel is also in a car that's moving along this way. But we're going to say, well, forget the overall motion of the whole thing going to the right. We're just going to focus on what's the momentum around the middle here. So sort of if you subtract out what the middle is doing, what's the rest of it doing relative to the middle? We're going to do that same thing in statistics. We're going to say, okay, given that the, there's some mean in this graph, say it's over here, what does the rest of it do relative to that? So, you know, maybe like we talked about with skewness, maybe it goes on for quite a long distance with a long tail of data going that way, but a shorter tail to the right. So here's a really simple short example of some data. So we have these different x values. We have one, we collected a data point that was two, a data point that was three, and so on. There's a couple fours, a bunch of fives, and a six. And I've just used i over here on the left as the sort of uh, indicator of, of which x value we're talking about. We're talking about i value number one, uh, x, x value number two, we'll call that x sub two, x value number three, we'll call that x sub three, and so on. So those i numbers are just kind of, you know, which number in the set we're talking about. The x numbers are the actual value of the data at that point. So we can make a little simple graph, and we could graph these data points. So if this is 1, and this is 2, and so on, we have 1 x value at 1, we have 1 x value at 2, we have 1 x value at 3, we have 2 x values at 4, we have 3 x values at 5, sorry, 4x values at 5, and 1x value at 6. So you can sort of see the overall shape that this data is taking is sort of like that. Now, how we were talking about the moment about the mean, we're just going to say, all right, so, so what is each of these x values compared to the mean, subtracting out the mean? So first, if we add up all these x values, And I'm just going to use the capital sigma Greek letter for the sum. So what's the sum of all these x values? The sum of them is 40. And there's 10 of them. So the average x hat is 40 divided by 10, which is 4. And I've purpose, purposely picked these values so that the average would be a nice round number. So the average is 4. It's right here. So let's go on down the list. So what is the first x value when you subtract out the average? Well, x sub i, x sub 1 in this case, is 1. 1 take away 4 is negative 3. So this first x value uh, is 3 less than the average. The next one is negative 2. The next one is negative 1. Then we have a bunch that are equal to the average, so this x value subtracting the average, subtracting 4, gives you 0. This one gives you 0 as well. Now we have some ones that are just 1 above, so these are each going to be 1 when you take that x and subtract the average, and then the last one is 2. So Take a second 
and add these values up. The sum of these, when you add them, is zero. And that really makes a lot of sense when you think about it because the average itself is the middle number so that there's just as much data that's greater than that number as there is less than that number. So it makes sense that if you take each data point and subtract out the average, it all sort of balances out. There's, there's just as much to this side over there as there is over there. So that wasn't very interesting, but here's where things start to get interesting. What if we want to know not just how the data balances out in a normal way, but we want to know sort of, okay, given that the data is going to balance out around the mean, how wide is the distribution of the data? Is it sort of a very narrow distribution? Is it a long one with lots of values that are high and lots of values that are low? Is it a value that's in the middle? And this, we know, is sort of the variance and the standard deviation. And the way that we calculate that is instead of just taking the difference between each x value and the average x value, we're going to take the square of that difference. So we're going to say, all right, instead of just negative 3, it's going to be negative 3 squared. which is 9. Instead of negative 2, we're going to have negative 2 squared, which is 4. So I'm just filling out the values for each of these x values when you subtract the mean and then square the result. And here's what's really interesting. Look how all the values become positive, which shows us that we just care about how far away a value is from the mean, whether it's less than the mean, down over here, whether it's greater than the mean. We're just looking at the distance from the mean. It's kind of like an absolute value. That's a nice thing about squaring, and people started to notice that when they started to play around with this math. The other thing that's really interesting and nice is that this farthest data point gets squared, so it ends up mattering so much more than these close-up data points. It ends up uh, contributing a huge value. So when we add all these up, we get 22. Now we take that 22 and we're going to divide by the number of data points. And again, see if you can figure out why people thought that they wanted to divide by the number of data points. It's not just that there's some rule that's already out there that says that you have to do that. People do that because there's a reason. And the reason is, if we have that same distribution of data with values to the left and values to the right, it doesn't really matter for our measurement of how much this data varies to the left and right, whether we have twice as much data, but it's just as spread out, or if we have not a lot of data, but it's just as spread out. We're really trying to measure the spread. So that means we have to sort of be factoring out the mean, and we did that using subtraction. And we also have to be factoring out the number of data points. We don't really want this number to get bigger and bigger and bigger just because we have more and more data if it's in the same shape. So that's why we're dividing by the number of data points. So 22 divided by 10 is 2.2. And that's going to be called the variance. It's just a name people made up um, because it shows how much the data varies to the left and varies to the right. And as you'll probably remember, this, the square root of the variance is known as the standard deviation. And we use lowercase sigma to represent the standard deviation. So because we squared those values to get variance, people started calling that value the second moment about the mean, or the second central moment. 
meaning the sort of second way, the using a power of two to summarize and describe all the data at once. So you might wonder, well, if we had a first moment, which was kind of boring, that just ended up being zero, and a second moment, much more interesting, variance, what about a third moment where we would use a power of three? What about a fourth moment where we would use a power of four? So things start to get really interesting here. So let's try to calculate that third moment. So for an x value of 1 and an average value of 4, we're going to do 1 minus 4 gives us negative 3. That's just what's inside the parentheses. And then when we cube that, negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 gives us negative 27. And we're going to go on down the list. So the next value gives us negative 2 because 2 minus 4 is negative 2. And cubing that negative 2 gives us negative 8. We have negative 1. Cubing that gives us negative 1. We have some zeros because 4 minus 4 is 0. We have some 1s because 1 cubed is 1. And then finally we have 6 minus 4 is 2. 2 cubed gives us 8. So what's really interesting about this is two things. Compared to squaring, where all the values were positive, so these have negative values and positive values. So we're sort of preserving the information about whether points are to the left of the average or to the right. So if we sort of go back and remember that we had this, this graph with these different data points, whatever they were, um, now we're able to sort of have separate information about how much the points to the left of the average um, are sort of valued in this, in this third moment and how much the ones to the right are. So then notice how much bigger this negative 27 is than the rest of these values. I mean, when we sum all this up and the negative 8 and the positive 8 sort of cancel out, negative 1 and a positive 1, the result is negative 24. So it's really dominated by these faraway numbers. So, so cubing, even more than squaring, is going to really value these faraway numbers. And so this, this value is going to be important for us um, giving an, a measurement of skewness because it's going to mean that when we have faraway values to the left of the average, those faraway, negative, those faraway values are going to be very negative, and the overall value of this third moment is going to be negative. When we have the opposite kind of setup, where we have a long tail of values to the right of the average that are greater than the average, um, that's going to mean that we have a very positive third moment. So now think about the fourth moment and how much those faraway numbers are going to dominate even more. So negative 3 to the power of 4, 81. Negative 2 to the power of 4, 16. Negative 1 to the power of 4, 1, and so on. So this far away first value of x is even more dominant now. And so this fourth moment is going to be really useful in giving us a sense of just how far away values are from the middle. So if we have a graph that looks something like this, even though most of the values are very close to the average, if we just have a little bit of these values out there, they're not going to add up to a whole lot. But if they're just a little bit more present in those tails, it's going to make a big difference to this fourth moment. And likewise, even if we have a lot of values away from the mean, but they're not really that far away from the mean in sort of this kind of distribution, for example, or you know, in a very sort of flat distribution where it really begins and ends abruptly, then um, there's not going to be any of these faraway values. 
So we're going to find that these kind of distributions are going to be much smaller in their fourth moment measurement than these kind of distributions. These are going to be really big. Now this fourth moment is going to be sort of the crucial part of our calculation for kurtosis. And exactly how this fourth moment relates to kurtosis and some of the other concepts and how that third moment relates to skewness is something we're going to talk about in the next video.